Hi, my name is Dr. Mia, GP and longevity doctor here today to talk about depression, specifically how your doctor will assess whether or not you have depression. So depression is probably one of the commonest things that we see in primary care. Often people come in with all sorts of symptoms, totally unrelated to mood. But once you dig a little bit deeper, it's very clear that someone's fatigue or bowel issues or concentration and lack thereof is likely to be related to their psychological state. We in clinic objectively and quantitatively assess someone's mood. Well, one of the commonest tools that's used all over the world is something called a PHQ-9, Patient Health Questionnaire 9. This is a validated tool that's used to assess whether someone is likely to have depression. It also tells us the severity of the depression. Is it mild? Is it moderate? Is it moderately severe? Is it severe? And one of the other things that it allows us to do, it allows us to monitor and track the progress of the intervention for someone's mood. So if someone does have depression, we see them once and we see them three months or six months later. If we redo the assessment, we can get a number at the end of the questionnaire that gives us an idea about whether whatever we've tried or whatever we've done, has that improved, at least quantitatively, the symptoms that the patient's experiencing and the degree of depression. So it's a really useful monitoring tool. In practice, not every clinician uses this. It's good practice to use this, but it can be a little bit laborious. It can be a little bit formulaic. So a lot of clinicians don't like these kind of protocolized questionnaires that much, especially when it's quite obvious that someone's got low mood, which a lot of the time it can be. Either way, let's walk through the questionnaire. Just before I get into it, it's important to be aware that this questionnaire was created as a tool for a clinician or a healthcare professional to use with a patient. It's not a self-assessment tool. I wouldn't recommend you go through this yourself and diagnose yourself with a particular problem. It doesn't quite work like that. There is a lot of context around this type of questionnaire. So having a discussion with your healthcare professional, if you're concerned, is going to be much more useful, much more appropriate in terms of understanding whether you do have a particular condition, what things can be done for it, and what the next steps are for you. So let's dive in. The actual assessment called a PHQ-9 because nine that there are actually nine questions involved in the whole assessment. Each one of these questions is scored from zero to three. If you get three for all of these questions, you get a maximum score of 27. 27 is the worst or the highest possible score that you can get indicating severe depression. If you're getting closer towards zero or five or 10, then it's much more unlikely that you have depression. So low score, not likely to be a mood disorder. Higher scores likely to be somewhere on the spectrum of kind of moderate, mild, mild moderate or severe mood disorders. Let's walk through and we can talk you through some of the questions as we go along. So I'm going to use this online calculator called MD Plus Calculator. Normally in practice, we have this questionnaire kind of baked into our clinical record. So if I see someone and I'm concerned about mood and I want to perform this validated set of questions to get an idea of uh, understanding where they sit and the spectrum of mood, then I can kind of press a button on my screen. These questions will pop up. I can walk through them, log it as I go along and it will be saved in the patient's record there to help with the diagnosis at that consult, but also there uh, for reference, should the patient see us again, which is highly likely if someone has mood disorders, because we're going to try an intervention and then we're going to monitor as we go along. But let's walk through the questionnaire. As I said, there's nine questions. Let's start at the top. When it comes to these nine questions, all of these questions are really in the context of what's been happening in the last couple of weeks. So all nine questions should be viewed in the context of symptoms over the last couple of weeks or so. So first question, do you have little interest or pleasure in doing things? Clinically, this is actually a really sensitive uh, question when it comes to depression. If people have no interest in doing the things that they used to, they used to enjoy playing football, they used to enjoy uh, enjoy playing games on the computer, now they get no pleasure in doing that. There's nothing that they enjoy. That's a pretty sensitive marker for having a mood disorder. There are loads of things that cause that type of symptom. Let's just mark something. So I'm having, let's say that a patient's having uh, no pleasure in doing things that they normally enjoy for more than half days. Next question, are you feeling down, depressed or hopeless? Pretty standard question question, as you'd expect for someone that you're worried that they may have a mood disorder, let's say you've been experiencing it for several days. Again, each one of these markers is a scored from zero, one, two, or three. And the options pretty much for all of them is I have not been experiencing it at all over the last couple of weeks. I've been experiencing it for several days, more than half the days, so for more than a week or nearly every day, which scores the maximum points 
out of three. Third question, do you have trouble falling or staying asleep or sleeping too much? Uh, so again, with depression, I think sometimes people assume it's purely psychological and it has no effect on uh, physicality. Uh, it's definitely not the case. Most people present with physical symptoms, things like fatigue, sleeping issues, bowel problems, poor concentration, almost ubiquitous to some degree for people that have depression. So you'll find that maybe 40 to 50% of the questions are related to physical symptoms rather than just how are you feeling and how it's affecting you uh, from a more psychological perspective. So this assesses both aspects, the physical and the psychological, which are very classic presenting symptoms for people that have depression. So any trouble falling or staying asleep or sleeping too much. So for a lot of people, they'll find that they just can't fall asleep. They find it difficult to doze off and they'll be sitting in bed staring at the ceiling for two or three hours before something happens. Another common pattern is that people doze off pretty quickly because they're really exhausted and then they end up waking up for some reason at two or three or four in the morning every single day for some inexplicable reason from their perspective and then they find it difficult to doze off or they just have poor quality sleep thereafter. For some people they have both. They just can't fall asleep, then they doze off and then they wake up really early again. So any kind of aberration of the normal sleeping pattern is likely to be an indicator or is a kind of sensitive indicator for mood disorders. I'm going to just put someone who's been suffering for several days with sleep issues. Next question, are you feeling tired or having little energy? One of the commonest things that I see in clinic is that people attend with fatigue or they feel tired all the time. It's probably one of the kind of top three symptoms people attend clinic with. Most people think it's due to something physical. They're worried that they've got a deficiency of iron. They're worried they've got a thyroid disease. They're worried they have something else that they can't explain. Often it's likely to be a kind of stress, chronic stress slash low mood disorder that seems to be affecting their energy level. So very common symptom uh, in the context of mood and mood disorders. So let's say this patient's experiencing this nearly every day, just feeling tired, can't get out of bed, just doesn't have the energy to do work, can't be bothered. All of these very classic symptoms with depression. Uh, next question, any poor appetite or overeating? Again, you can see the questions with the sleep. It was like, are you getting no sleep or loads of sleep? With the appetite, it's like, don't want to eat or you just can't stop yourself eating. So I think it's both extremes you can see when it comes to the physical symptoms. Again, commonly in my experience, uh, both, you see a lot of both people just have kind of anorexia in the sense that they just don't have the desire to eat more that they just can't be bothered uh, and they just can't be bothered to eat and they don't have the desire and they're not really feeling that they need to eat or want to eat so it's all part of this oh like kind of just not feeling it selection of symptoms like that i don't have any pleasure in doing anything i just can't concentrate i can't be bothered to kind of cook or make something so their appetite kind of uh, goes very poor. And then for some people, they find that they just can't stop eating and they just get a lot of short term comfort uh, and pleasure in eating. Obviously, that doesn't last and eventually comes back to haunt you. You tend to feel much worse after you've eaten short term and in the longer term as you start to put weight on. Both of these symptoms are, are actually generally equally common. That's from my experience. I don't actually know what the evidence says in terms of the statistics of what people have, but I definitely see both of those very commonly. Uh, next question Are you feeling bad about yourself or that you're a failure or you've let your, yourself or your family down. I find this to be a very telling symptom. So often people will immediately say, yes, they feel guilty all the time. They feel like a failure. We see this pretty commonly and it usually tracks pretty well with kind of moderate and, and severe depression to start having these types of symptoms. So let's just say someone's having that for uh, more than half the days. Next question, trouble concentrating on things such as reading the newspaper or watching television or innocuous activities. Again, I find this to be a very, very common symptom that most people with depression will just have trouble being able to stay focused and very easily distracted uh, as well and can spend a lot of time doing nothing or nothing kind of inverted commas for large parts of the day. So yeah, very common. So let's say someone is suffering with that nearly every day. Getting towards the end now, three more questions. Have you noticed that you're moving or speaking slowly that other people would or could have noticed? Or are you so fidgety and restless that you've been moving a lot more than usual? So again, both sides of the spectrum, not moving at all or moving much less than you used to or just can't stop moving and very restless and very fidgety. Most of the time, in my experience, it tends to be people moving much slower than they used to, but certainly both are possible. Uh, so let's say someone's experiencing that for several days. Any thoughts that you'd be better off dead or that thoughts of harming yourself in some way? So this is a very direct 
question about are you feeling suicidal? Are you feeling like you want to harm yourself? So this is kind of one of the things that they teach you in med school. One of the reasons that you will fail your kind of psychiatric section of your med school exams is if you don't ask about things like self-harm and suicide. So actually, you may think that it's quite a blunt question asking, have you ever thought about killing yourself? Have you ever thought about harming yourself? But actually, I've often found that when we ask this question, people are quite relieved that you ask the question because it means that you understand where their headspace is at. And often, very commonly, people will say yes uh, to both of the above. Not always, but it's surprising to me when we ask this question, how many people who say yes. So I think this is a really important question to ask. It needs to be asked, certainly on the first assessment. It may not always be appropriate to ask it for someone that's been on uh, medications for 30 years and has been quite stable, but certainly first time you're seeing someone and the, and the kind of, if there's any indication that people may be struggling or, or maybe kind of scoring worse than they used to or objectively uh, struggling, we need to be asking this question and need to be understanding whether someone is in this kind of headspace. You may also think that people that are suicidal may not want to talk about it or maybe quite obscure about it and kind of not talk about it. Actually, again, not my clinical experience. If you mention it and ask the question, people almost immediately up front will say, yes, uh, I've been thinking about it, but I've had no no plans to uh, to actually do anything about it. Or yes, I've harmed myself. I've done it this way. If someone does say yes to any of these questions, you, you definitely need to start asking additional questions about you know, if someone has planned, how much have they thought about killing themselves? Have they made a plan? Have they written anything down? Have they spoken to anyone else about it? Have they bought anything that may be a kind of plan to actually harm or hurt themselves or kill themselves? So that takes you off into a kind of slightly separate route. And clearly someone that's suicidal will immediately kind of go into the kind of severe category of having a, a low mood issue. Uh, but yeah, really critical question. It's not unusual for people to have fleeting thoughts about wanting to harm themselves or kill themselves. That is actually quite common for that thought to cross your mind very quickly and then for it quickly to disappear. So I think the, those are the types of things that need to be discussed with a healthcare professional. And then we can contextualize that in the context of all of your symptoms and try and make sense of what that means and what, what we can do to, to help manage those symptoms for you. So let's put one point for that. Um, so that's actually the nine questions. There is one other additional question that's available. It's not part of the PHQ-9 per se. So it doesn't actually add a point, but it's a question that kind of is a kind of proxy for all of the other questions that gives us an idea of where someone's at. So I, I find it quite a useful thing to ask. I often ask this question at the beginning of the uh, of the consult, not exactly in the way that it's it's articulated here. How they've said it here is to ask the patient, how difficult have these problems made it to do work, to take care of things at home or to get along with other people? I often ask a similar question before I start digging into the, into the questionnaire and I've got a flavour of the types of issues that they're discussing. I try and get a flavour of how impactful their symptoms are in terms of everyday life, work, uh, relationships, but it gives us a kind of general overview. Again, it's not part of the official questions. You don't need to actually ask it, but quite a nice question to ask. Certainly when you're following up as well, if you don't want to go through all the questions, it gives a kind of quick proxy about how someone's doing. So once you've done the nine questions, it will come out with a point score. Remember, this is out of 27. Maximum you can get is 27. And again, 27 is the highest score, indicating the most severe form of depression. Again, it's a guide. It doesn't say specifically you have depression. All of this is in the context of a wider history, your kind of relationship history, what's been going on with your life. Has anything major happened recently in your life uh, as well? So I guess the clinical context, all the other parts of the history are really important to contextualize this number. It's not just, oh, you got the number, oh, you got that disease. You need to have this treatment. It doesn't work like that. So that's why speaking to a healthcare professional, if you have these concerns, is really important. Gord, 16 points. Uh, just to give you an idea of what the points roughly indicate. So if you've got a point score of above 20, that indicates that you've got severe depression. So you're in the top tier, so to speak. 20 to 27 points means that your depression is pretty bad, obviously going to need some form of treatment. If you're between 15 to 19, then you've got more moderately severe depression. If you've got between 10 to 14, then you've got moderate depression. Five to nine is mild. Uh, anything below five is basically minimal or kind of no mood disorder at all. So again, depending on the score and the clinical context, we can start to consider what are the appropriate interventions? What do we need to do in this situation? So there isn't a blanket, oh, you got this score, we need to give you this medication, we need to do this type of therapy. It doesn't work like that. Again, it's very much dependent on the individual issues they've had in the past, what's caused this symptom in the present, what do they want to do, what do they like the thought of, have they tried therapy before? Loads of things to consider. Uh, main options when it comes to kind of mood are the, the, the kind of more obvious ones, including therapy. So accessing 
using therapy. It's free to access uh, therapy in the UK health service. Can take a bit of time, but nonetheless tends to have a good outcome. Really useful for kind of unpicking and understanding the root cause of mood disorder and anxiety disorders as well. Medications may be appropriate depending on the age of the patient, whether they've tried it in the past, whether they want to take it, whether it's necessary. Certainly, it is a common treatment for a lot of people. Uh, the, the advantage with the tablet versus the therapy is that once you take a tablet, you can take it immediately. It doesn't always work immediately. Most people start to notice benefit after a couple of weeks or so, and you need to take it every day ongoing for a kind of period of time, which is usually kind of months uh, rather than weeks. Uh, the main benefit is that you get some kind of functional improvement. So it doesn't kind of solve the problem uh, other than kind of helping you function over a period of time and time itself solves it. But it certainly doesn't solve it in the way therapy kind of unpicks an issue and helps you to provide uh, the kind of right tools to manage a particular condition. So with the medication, it helps you functionally. It helps you to function better day to day in your work, in your relationships, in your day to day life. So if you're struggling with concentration, sleep issues, you're feeling low, you're feeling helpless, you're feeling like you may want to harm yourself, all these things and to struggle and manage with these things day to day is horribly difficult. So the tablets are there to help minimize and decrease those feelings and those sensations. Again, it doesn't solve the underlying cause, but that's why in an ideal world, depending on where you sit in this severity spectrum and what your other issues are and kind of what you do and don't want to do, it may be appropriate to do medication and therapy. But one of the other kind of high level things that people sometimes neglect, which is incredibly powerful from managing a mood disorder perspective is exercise. So there's loads of really good, high quality, like wow evidence to say how impactful even a small amount of exercise regularly can manage mild to moderate depression. So certainly something that I encourage all of my patients. Sometimes it's counterintuitive for people to exercise when they're feeling tired and they can't be bothered to do stuff and they hate doing everything in their life currently and they just don't have the drive to do stuff. And that's not unusual when it comes to exercise. Exercise is often a treatment for a lot of conditions that are related, that, that are associated with fatigue and motivation. It's ironically a treatment for fatigue, but Again, it's one of those things that when people do it, I, I can't think of an example of when someone who is suffering with kind of mild or moderate depression and has done exercise with the explicit desire to try and treat and improve their mood that hasn't benefited significantly. And the added benefit with exercise, it doesn't just help your mental state, it helps your physical state as well, which reinforces your mental state in a positive way also. So don't neglect exercise as a kind of general tool for health generally, but also for most of for, for most people on any parameter within this tool who has mood disorders, exercise is likely to be helpful. Other interventions may be helpful also, but don't neglect the kind of stuff that we know we should probably be doing anyway, even though it's difficult to do when we're feeling low, but we know it works uh, really, really well. And that's pretty much it. Hope you found it useful. Thanks so much for watching. Hit that subscribe button. Till next time, stay healthy.